Welcome to the Winning Golf Podcast, where we will help you play better golf more often. Prepare to take your game to the next level and play the golf of your dreams with our host coach, Mark Pearson. Hello and welcome to Winning Golf. Today I have a fantastic special guest for you. His name is Ian Highfield. I've known Ian for about eight years. We've worked together with some players. Uh, we've been colleagues at the same academies. Ian then moved over to the States. He's been very successful over there. He's worked with a lot of great players. He's worked with a lot of great coaches. He's got his own podcast. He's a speaker at trade seminars and he's written two books. He's one of the people I admire most in our trade. He certainly has my respect. And above all that, he's a very good friend. He's one of the most positive people I've ever known. Uh, so hopefully we'll find some nuggets. What I've asked him to talk to you about today is trying to get your A game out onto the golf course. Ian is a specialist mental coach. He's a performance coach. This is his bag. He's got some great thoughts on it. So let's get going. Hi, Ian. How are you? I'm good, Mark. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks, mate. Have you been CrossFit? I literally have just been to CrossFit, yeah. It was brutal this morning. It was brutal. <laughs> How many times a week or are you just daily? So, well, before I started at, at Ledbetter, it was probably five or six times a week. I'll go a lot this month. So Good man. Rather allows me to eat whatever I want. That means I put the burger. This is where I get it wrong, right? That means I eat cheeseburgers and milkshakes because I feel like I've earned them. <laughs> Good man. Right. Well, first of all, thanks. I'm super pumped that you're my first guest uh, on Winning Golf Show. Um, as you know, you're one of the guys that I've got uh, probably the, one of the largest respects for in the game. Uh, but it wasn't, wasn't always like that when we first met. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to tell the, the folks that are listening how we met, and then I'll, I'll let you fill in the gaps from there uh, to where we were. But it, how long ago was it now? About seven, eight years, something like that? Okay. Might be longer. Time goes fast, doesn't matter, yeah. it's been around that be, time and I, I was given nice. a lesson in the academy uh, at Alton in Leeds and uh, a knock on the door and you popped your head round uh, and introduced yourself uh, and said you were interested in maybe coming and doing some mental clinics, etc, etc. Um, and I, because of, largely I think because I got a customer in with me, I was very polite and uh, said, yeah, why not, let's get together, let's have uh, a coffee for half an hour. Uh, and to be honest, as you know, I thought you were probably one of those NLP nutters who had just taken a course looking for a, a way out of probably a proper job um, <laughs> and trying to do something that was easy, even though we all know it's not easy doing what you're trying to do. Uh, so I said I'd have a coffee with you. I said half an hour, but I thought that would be 10 minutes. I literally thought it would be you know, a quick coffee, say hi, and not a lot to offer. I think we sat talking for about two hours, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you, you were, as you are now, you were engaging, you were super positive, um, you weren't anything like the person that I presumed you were going to be walking in there. <laughs> uh, and, and really, from that moment in time, I, I wanted you in the academy at Alton. It was a Nike academy at the time, wasn't it? And you came yep. and joined us. Uh, and then you've done great ever since. So I'll let you tell the story of where you've gone since you left us. Well, the, I see your story a little differently. I think you actually told me you haven't got time to be speaking to an NLP nutter. That doesn't sound like me. And, and I don't think it mattered too much that you had a client in the room. Um, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, you, 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 know, you gave me that, that time of day. And it, that just, you didn't know this at the time, but that had just come off the back of me being at another golf club, uh, a club that I was a member of. Um, and I was coaching and I'd, I'd been told to stop um, because things like just let kids play. Uh, they don't need mental training. Um, I guess a lot of the urban myths were being thrown around. And sure. uh, actually it started to impact on my golf. I was playing off, I think, three handicap at the time, maybe four flirting between those two. And, you know, if I missed a shot, people would be like, oh, it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. And you know, it started to take the enjoyment out of the game. So it, I was probably at a crossroads there where I was thinking, okay, maybe this won't work. Um, and, and then my ideas that, that I'd formulated, they were given to someone else at this golf club. And I was like, wow, 
<laughs> okay. No names. Well, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> um, but think if you hadn't have been gracious with your time and if you had, if we hadn't have sat and talked for two hours, you know, I definitely left that meeting with a, with a stride in my step and a bit more confidence and a, and a thought of, well, maybe this can work. My, if you'd have shut the door on me, I like to think I would have had the resilience to go to the next place or the next place, but you just never know. Um, so, yeah, hopefully. So realistically though, you're, you're the first person that really gave me a, a break. And then it was uh, Mr. Connor. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Cox. Yes. And with a little bit of coaxing, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gavins, reluctantly, Mr. Gavins. Um, and, and then I think I maintained a couple of the juniors from the other golf club, just sort of in private and, and chatting. So, um, and, and then people at the Alton Academy started to ask me questions when I would be up there. Um, and uh, we all know Mr. Gavins that year put his foot down. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then a few more Euro pro players started to come uh, to, to see me. Um, and it just evolved. And then I remember it clear as day. Um, I was walking across the putting green at Alton. I was coming to see you. And Mr. Hansen was walking in the opposite direction. So I, I I kind of like wanted, would get out his way to not be in his personal space. And he sort of veered towards me. And I was like, is Chris Hansen about to speak to me? And he was like, hey, I'm Chris. Um, I've been chatting with Mark. I want to do some work. So now I was like, oh, wow, this is a great opportunity. Um, and, you know, it, you got to be in the right place at the right time. And you got to meet the right people. Chris, model pro, yourself, model pro me learning and, and putting a lot of effort in, um, you know, and, and I guess Dan's ability under pressure coming down the stretch, especially in the Euro Pro, yeah, uh, Sam do. Connor, some of the, uh, Sam's ability to battle and fight. Like, I can't say it was me. I, 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 we can't say it was you. It's a combination of so many I, factors. One of the things I think, Ian, is that, and I've always said this when I've been part of any successful team with players, you're never really quite sure who, who's doing it. I mean, we know the player is, don't we? But, but behind that then, who has the biggest influence after the player is it, very difficult. And sometimes it can just be those small things and a bit of luck at the right time, can't it? Yeah, and, you know, that, what, what happened there gave me, gave me confidence. I started to actually think, you know what, I can... Because by, by now, I'm, I'm coaching and I'm getting up at, I'm getting up at five in the morning uh, I'm going to the gym, um, then going and working for Johnson & Johnson in medical sales. Um, I connected with a couple of other coaches down towards Nottingham workshop area. Marcus Bell, phenomenal guy. Daniel Bernstein, great guy. Marcus Bell, actually, very, very, very smart coach when it comes to bio, mechanics, etc. cetera. Um, so they started doing a similar thing. For, for me that, that you did and give me a foundation to work from. I started to help their players. So I'm going to work, uh, getting up at five in the morning, going and working for Johnson & Johnson. I've got my golf clothes on under my suit. I'm taking my suit off at lunchtime, maybe coaching an hour or so. Going back to Johnson & Johnson in the afternoon, praying that my accounts are fine. Coming to Alton, coaching, hanging out, uh, and then going home and reading. And spending a lot of time with Matthew Cook, who we nerded out and did a lot of reading and formulated some frameworks together. And you know, that was just an amazing time, man. It was, it was crazy to think. Sometimes how... I think I, I try and always say this to, to some of the, the young players, you know, we've both worked with some of those guys that you've mentioned now there at times they get a little fed up and cheesed off with how difficult it can be. But then a bit like you're doing, that was a difficult time for you, wasn't it? I know you, you had, you know, a lot of sacrifice during yeah. your journey up. And when you look back, it felt probably really tough at the time. But now you look back and you think they're fantastic times. And I'm sure, you know, when I look back to playing amateur golf with my caravan pulled along the side of it, you know, <laughs> brilliant times, you know, they were absolutely fantastic times. But you maybe don't always appreciate them at the time because you, you're striving so hard maybe to get to the next mm -hmm. level. I, yeah, I couldn't agree. And, and that just does, you know... From from meeting you to to where I am now, you can you can 
categorize it as okay yeah it's it's successful um but you should always look back and reflect and i always i read shoe dog um by uh phil knight the ceo of of nike or nike as we say over here and uh he literally makes a statement. He's at a basketball game with Warren Buffett uh, and Bill Gates. That's who he sat next to at a basketball game. And he says, okay. in his mind, all he wants to do is go back to that first day when the trainers were, were blue ribbon, I think. And, he, and he's starting building it because the journey is the main thing. He's literally hit this pinnacle of pinnacles and all he wants to do is, is go back. So... It's the cool. Are often super exciting, though, aren't they? When you Say start, that again. you start any journey. It's super exciting if it's if it's what you believe in and where. Yeah, you and go. I think like if I'd have known the sacrifice that you have to make to come to America, how much money it costs in visas, um, some of the things I would go through again with people not necessarily buying into my philosophy or trying to shut me down. Would I have done it? I don't know, like it, you, but you should never count the cost. You should never think this is what it's going to cost or this is what it's going to take. If you love it, you, you should just do it. And I, and I think that's a big thing for a golfer. Well, one, one of the questions I, I do want to ask you, because you're right, uh, it's massive for golf, but it's also life. It, you, your career is an example, isn't it? So I, as you know, I, I warble on about the, the, the five Ps. And, and the first one there is passion. And, and my indicator of whether generally, whether there's any passion for a player is, you know, what sacrifices are they making? And if they're sort of not prepared to make them, it, it throws a question mark up. But I, I'm interested in you. What, what, what do you think drove you to make these sacrifices? It's obvious you've made sacrifices. I know you obviously really well, but I know the sacrifices you've made mm -hmm. over those years to, to get to the next stage. And you, and you still are making them and you'll make some more because you, you want yeah. to go forward. What do you think has driven you? You know, I know, the exact, I know the exact thing. My dad never made those sacrifices. You know, he, he talks now about stories of, oh, when I was working for Radio Nottingham, he was my runner. And this is now a guy who's sitting on TV on Sky Sports, presenting every hour. <laughs> so, and I don't, I don't, I've never had this conversation with my dad. I don't know if he'll listen to this or not. And I, I, I ask him those questions. I don't know if he regrets it or not, um, because may, maybe he doesn't. He's done very well with his life. But I used to listen to him speak. And I was like, well, if I was working for Radio Not, I wouldn't want that guy to be my runner. I would want to be the guy on Sky Sports. So your, your, your personal environment is a big driver for you and I've taken a lot of qualities off my dad the way I coach golf is very similar to how my dad coached rugby um, I started coaching squash athletes over here and doing a bit of football or soccer as they say and again very very try and be innovative and creative very much like my dad was um, lots of games always trying to be in match situations just like my dad was but then the business side of it very different to my dad like yeah I'll take the risk I'll, I'll go to America with no visa and we'll just figure it out. The worst that can happen is I'll come, I'll come back to where I was. Which is exactly what you did. Yeah, yeah. So, so you landed a job at, go on, remind me, Gary Gilchrist. Yeah, Gary Gilchrist. So Matthew Cook, who I mentioned earlier, we were working on like a coaching framework together. By the way, why would you leave Yorkshire? <laughs> I remember... Yeah, I, I'd moved to Yorkshire. So, you know. I, yeah, I, surely that's living the dream. Nottingham to Yorkshire, Yorkshire to Florida. <laughs> Big step. <laughs> um, so, yeah, me and Matthew were working on these coaching philosophies. And Matthew's like, his, his ability to take risks and just go with it and work hard, it far supersedes anything that, that I do. So I think a lot of, Again, seeing how Matthew lives his life, and not all aspects, but some aspects I would model. His hard work, his work ethic, his ability to take risks would be one of them. Um, so he's out at Gary Gilchrist, more as like an apprentice. Uh, and he recommends to a couple of people at Gary Gilchrist, hey, why don't you just check out these YouTube videos? 
So they do, and they invite me over, uh, and then they offer me a job as an assistant uh, mental coach. Um, and I'm earning good money working in the medical industry and side hustle working for you with the money was good. Right. So I'm living a good life. I've got two houses. I've got a nice company car and, and they offer me peanuts, <laughs> but I'm like, I got to do it. Oh, yeah. So it was the right decision. Well, which was great. Cause you know, I, I remember speaking to you about it and you were very supportive and you know, there was a couple of people who were like, don't be crazy. This will never work out. You've got a good job, get your pension, you know, the, yeah. I think the people that are very close to you and, and, and sort of love you the most, like your family, they don't always give you the best advice. But people that are one removed from that, like yourself or my friends, yeah, yeah, yeah. they give you very good advice. So my, my mum and dad were always like, oh, safety first. Whereas you're like, yeah, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, go out there, gamble. Which is why I ring you for advice. Because it's the same thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you don't want advice from a safety and comfort standpoint. Um, you're already giving yourself that, uh, that advice. Yeah. You, don't, you don't need that. You're programmed to give yourself that advice. So, yeah, so I, I spoke to you, um, a couple of my friends that, that you know um, from golf. Uh, and and I, I did a podcast on this myself. Like, if I hadn't have had the friends that I had, like you, um, Gav, scarve and a few others um it it would have been a lot harder to do but yeah i i took the risk i came out and then the craziest thing happened the day that i landed the um academy split <laughs> so gary gilchrist and his wife um were getting a divorce and they split the academy in half and then they basically asked me hey which half of the academy do you want to work on and i was like well this is a solid first day <laughs> Um, so I, I made a decision to go with the people that were the most invested in me. I hadn't really met Gary that much. I'd had a couple of conversations with him, thought he was a great guy. thought he was a good motivator. Um, but realistically I'd shook up a strong friendship with a guy called Zach Parker. Zach was putting me up in his house. I, I was babysitting his daughter, um, becoming friends of his wife. So it was like, it was a no brainer. Uh, so I joined Bishop's Gate. Um, and then after about 18 months of being at Bishopsgate, I got promoted to being in charge of Bishopsgate and IJGA. So IJGA is another junior academy um, in South Carolina. Uh, the owner of Bishopsgate bought IJGA. Uh, and I went between both academies, split my time. I was in charge of the mental performance program for uh, 140 junior golfers. Uh, and I worked at that time with Kevin Smeltz. Yeah. Uh, who's coached Charles Howell and a few other tour players uh, and Stuart Morgan, um, who's just a phenomenal coach, um, director of performance for the Swiss PGA now, doing a great job with Bernd Wiesberger. So I, I'd, I'd now, um, before, realistically, my network was, was yourself. I didn't know anyone in golf, you. And then it started to grow. But not, not only were you expanding your network, you, you were expanding your skills and, and you were coaching more, weren't you? Because the market's pretty small in the UK, isn't it? But suddenly you were able to grow, you were able to do more. It, it's, it's amazing when you come out to the US. These doors don't open for you, but oh. they're, they're a jar. You just have to walk through them. So, you know, I'm there. Uh, once Kevin Smeltz comes in. So I'm chatting with Zach Parker, very smart guy, Dr. Robert Neal, one of the world leading biomechanists, uh, and Charles Howe walks through the door, and then Smeltzy walks in. So it's Dr. Rob Neal, Charles Howe, who's won infinite, and over 30 million on tour, I think, three career wins perhaps, the world leading biomechanist and a PGA tour player and me. And I can recite multiple times that, that that happened. You're just around these people. I remember um, Phil Kenyon. I just turned up one day and Phil Kenyon's there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, all right. And he's like, oh, all right, Ian. And I was like, oh, man, Phil Kenyon knows my name. That's awesome. <laughs> and, and then now it just becomes normal to, to see Phil at the odd event, to chat to him. And that was never a, a, a network that, that I was in. It changed your environment, Ian. There you go. There you go. 
There you go. Nice little plug there. Nice little plug. I know a good podcast about that. <laughs> so, um, so you got going. And then more recently, what have you done more recently? Because you've been everywhere, haven't you? You've spoken, you've done more. Yeah, it, it, it got to the point where um, I was conflicted with the junior. I think that the junior academies could, could be phenomenal. I think Stuart was closest to getting it right, but there's always a slight conflict between what's best for the kid and what's best for business and profit. Yeah. Um, and again, so the environment isn't necessarily as powerful as it's going to be. And there was a few disagreements. I, I was very much into protecting kids from physical and mental burnout. And a lot of people involved in the academies are the harder you work, the better you get. And, and when you're a, a teenager going through all these changes and, what, and away from your family, we got to understand the human more than we understand how many hours have you practiced this week. So I kind of lost my voice a bit. Stuart left. I decided to leave. So I started game like training uh, with Matthew. Um, we got an investor and we were doing online education for golfers, golf coaches, and we were actually selling products uh, online. Game like training now is just me. Um, and I coach from Atlanta. Uh, I consult for David Ledbetter Academies. Um, I've started working with uh, one of the, the potentially best LPGA tour players. Um, and just having a great time. People ask me to speak. Uh, my second book has been really well received. Lecturing for Penn State University. And, and, you know, just, just having fun, just and, doing. And you're also getting involved with, uh, with business and people and corporate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, through, uh, now, well, my network grew and I was well, teach them business. I, yeah, no. <laughs> well, it's funny. I was introduced to someone. There's a guy called Kevin Sprecker in New York. Who's been amazing for me. Just him and his wife are just good people incredible and his kids are amazing and they have helped me out so much put me on pga tour radio connected me with people they connect me with someone from uh yorkshire area and i'm like oh this is interesting and <laughs> guess who his best mate is you mr tattersall so oh, i yeah, um, John. yeah, yeah. I, yeah it, it came like all it. the way back around yeah, yeah. I, was, I didn't know where you were going with that one but yeah, yeah. so my people that have been helping me out for a good few years connect yeah. me with john uh, and it's John, John's helping me get a little bit more into the corporate world. Uh, I've got some stuff myself where, um, obviously my podcast is a bit away from golf. Um, and yeah, I'm being invited to do corporate talks, talk on stage. It's just, it's just fun. It, from, from, from my point of view, I, I, you know, obviously we, we chat fairly regularly, but from, from watching from this side of the Atlantic, it's been fantastic to see that. It's grown. It's not always been plain sailing. Far from it at times. You know, you've rung me up and, you know, you say you'll never believe what's happened and, and stuff yeah. like that. But I think, you know, uh, it's a super journey. It's, it's not why I've got you on the show, by the way, because I, I want us to do some, some golf stuff specific. Yeah. I think from, from a golfer, particularly someone who's maybe a tournament player, could learn about your journey. You know, somebody that wants to, to get on tour could, could learn from the sacrifice uh, what they've had to go through or what they have to go through is very similar to what you've had to do for your career. So I think there's a great parallel there that, you know, they can take from it. Yeah. And I, I agree. I mean, you only have to speak to Chris, right? He, he re, he's relayed that story a couple of times to me, the caravan and almost being in tears and, you know, didn't know what he was going to do. And, but he, he never, he never gave up. He never quit. And he, and he, and he got there. And then it's a choice, right? Do you want to stay there? <laughs> Absolutely. Chris has that choice. I had that choice. I didn't want to stay at the junior academy. So I, I changed my goal and dream. I'm sure any pro is going to go through all of this on the way to the tour. That's going to end someday. Whether it ends when you lose your card the first time, whether it ends after you've played in the Ryder Cup, whether it ends through injury, it's going to end someday and then it starts again. This will probably end someday for me. What's yeah. next? And ends for us all. We spoke about that a lot, haven't we, with players? That, that yeah. We 
with a, you know where, where they perceive their level and then then it's maybe even more difficult than maybe at that point okay that's brilliant that that's uh, an awesome uh, up-to-date catch-up I think it is yeah so the real reason that uh, I've got you on the show is um, and this is what I want our listeners to take away is all the time we as coaches you know see guys that can hit it great, perform well in practice, you know, maybe on the lesson tee, on the range, they tell you they're hitting it great when they're on their own, but then they go on the golf course and they are terrible. You know, you, then you can also, you know, we, we've shared golfers uh, that we've worked with where, you know, I'm, I'm saying to you that, you know, their techniques are good. In practice, we're getting sort of some good numbers, some, some good results in practice, and then it doesn't really happen. So, you know, my question is, what do we need to do to, to take that range game out onto the golf course? Um, and, and how would you go about it? So first, first one, what, what do you need to do to be able to get it out there? Yeah, you, you, you got to understand that um, as, a, as a human, you're probably seeking comfort and you probably want safety. So when you turn up to practice, you are seeking to um, hit it good. You are seeking to feel good about yourself. You want to do something where you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that, that was it. I, I achieved. Unfortunately, that's not golf. So rather than turn up to practice, and you actually said it in, in the introduction to this topic, you know, they, they perform well in practice. Ultimately, create an environment where you can't perform well yet. So build games, build challenges, build technical practice circuits that involve slow motion swings or drills where you have to really think or combinations of multiple drills. So your brain is always jumping from one task to the other. Um, if you're going to play a trackman combine and your best score on the combine is 70, you have to go between every shot and hit a bunker shot inside 10 feet. And then you can come back to your next shot of the combine. So you've just made it more representative of golf. You've just made it harder. And I bet that you, if your average score is 70 in a normal environment, if you interleave it with a bunker shot or a chip or a putt, your score will dramatically decrease. So absolutely. Um, I mean, we, we've talked about this for countless hours. Yeah. Uh, in fact, my five Ps would have only been four Ps if I'd never met you because you, you are definitely the person that has opened me up that practice had to get hard, harder, the environment needed to change, et cetera, et cetera. And, I mean, you know, I, I took them personally as a coach, and this, this is only through working with you, but I took a massive leap when... Chris needed to make the cut in the final tournament of the year in Portugal uh, to retain his card. Uh, and then I, I announced to him on Tuesday morning when we got there that I was going to try and break him in practice. Yeah. Uh, and make it so difficult. And he looked at me a little bit sheepish and I said, well, no matter what I do to you on that range, no matter how hard we make it, how difficult that becomes, it can't be as hard as playing two rounds for your career. Yeah. And, 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 and we did make it very hard. And that, and that was only a small example of it uh, on there. And I guess, I guess my real question, so, so I've always liked, so my, my fourth P is pressure, but it's not just pressure. It's not just consequence, is it? There's, there's other elements that we need to change. So what, what do you perceive those elements are that need to change for golfers? And, and I guess a secondary question that, are any more important than others? So like when someone's practicing, what do they need to change? Yeah. Is, is, do they need a consequence? Do they need some space? Yeah. What I, okay. I can, yeah, I'll answer that. So just to give a reference to Chris, when we were in Dubai, I saw Chris drop three balls on one side of the pitching green. And there was a sign that could be no bigger than six foot, uh, sorry, six inches by eight inches. And Chris goes, I'm going to hit it. And he basically hit it with all three balls. All three balls landed in the foot of, within a foot of each other. But he went drop, hit, drop, hit, drop, hit. And he's got 
basically, after he, Chris has hit that first ball, he's got a, a, an information bank readily available to him that he's never going to have on the golf course. He already knows, okay, I hit that like this, the grass felt like this, the wind felt like this. So he has information to now play the next shot. It's basically cheating. So we're all cheating in practice. In tennis, you get a second serve. In golf, you don't get a second shot. But all we're doing in golf... We reload is, quite a bit, though, don't forget. Yeah, a few people listening to this probably... Re My dad reloads a lot, so he gets a lot of second shot. Well, actually, it's not, is it? It's his third shot, unfortunately, for him. Um, Sorry, carry on. So what, using that as an example, Chris can execute that skill so easily because there's very low space between each shot, very low variability in the task. Well, no variability and very low challenge. So whenever a golfer goes to practice, you need to increase the space between your shots. You need to increase the variability in task and you need to increase the challenge. And if you are trying to make a swing change, you need to do that. And if you are trying to get ready to perform, you need to do that. You just do it in slightly different ways. So, so is, is, there, is there a point at which that could be too difficult? So if you're losing a, using a new skill or if maybe you're new to the game, for example, we, you know, we've talked a lot of reference here to... Um, just good players, but there's you know a lot of average players, a lot of people that are maybe new to the game. So, is is there a question? Is, is there a situation where you need to get the hang of it first, or you know does that work from day one? Or for for a beginner golfer, their session might be t ten balls, trying to hit the center of the face, then change to ten balls trying to do something with their wrist or their grip. And then they might just repeat that. So 10 balls back to trying to hit the center of the face and then 10 balls back to something working on their technique. So a beginner golfer might have two stations, 10 balls at each. Um, when I would work with Chris or when I work with a couple of college players at Real Good Over Here or PGA Tour Canada or LPGA, I might have four or five stations and it's three balls at each because for the elite player spacing has to be high variability has to be high challenge has to be high for someone who's just beginning if it was an actual complete beginner it could just be 20 balls trying to hit the center of the face it really could but as soon as they show some form of skill or ability you probably want to have like 10 ball sets. Um, I think for the general golfer coming to Alton to practice or any of your other academies, if they picked up five balls at a time and let's say, okay, it's Mark's drill, Mark, Mark's drill number one. And they did five balls in five minutes focusing on drill number one. Then they changed to drill number two did five balls in five minutes focusing on drill number two. And then let's say they could hit one or two balls full routine to a target. And then they could repeat that again. That is going to keep the brain engaged in the task. And it's going to help you learn because you're creating an environment of spacing, variability and challenge. Okay. And let me butt in here because yep. um, you know as well as I do. I'm, I'm a believer, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, players don't buy into this very easily, do they? Because um, they look like a lemon. Um, yeah. So, for example, um, I think they what, look awesome. By the way, anyone doing this, I think you look. Oh amazing. Well, yeah, we think he knows what he's yeah. doing, but they don't. And and the other guys on the range think he's off his head. Yeah. So, classic example, almost the exact um, practice that you described. So, I was with Chris when Chris lived in, in Spain. I was there. We had a track man test going, 
we had him playing, we were trying to get him to create more bounce on bunker shots. We had him playing one-handed bunker shots. And then we had a, a swoosh drill, putting drill set up. So three little stations, he had to walk about 15, 20 yards and he'd hit one shot on one station, one on the next, one on the other. And um, I, th I think we had a conversation about this and then you were trying to say, get as much noise, as much interference as you can in there. So I've done this and uh, I, we set a score and said, you know, if he made it, I would buy lunch. And if he didn't, he would buy lunch. And then what happened, a lady came and wanted to use the bunker. There's only really room for one person, maybe two, but she was very novice. And Chris being a nice guy, didn't want to stop the lady practicing because I've explained it'll be a while, it'll walk from one to the other. And so she said, no, it's fine, I'll just sit and watch. So Chris was very uncomfortable now because she couldn't practice and she was going to sit and watch, which is a bit weird when a, a European tour player is worried about one lady watching him, but it was a strain. Then a group of eight Dutch guys came just about to tee off and started moving his balls on the swoosh drill. And he got really rattled. And it does, it's pretty difficult to get him really rattled. Mm. And he said, oh, come on, let's just pack this in and go for lunch. And I do you remember your words. I just said, not a chance, because this was now perfect yep. in my mind from what you were trying to get. But, but back to my original question is, I guess, he felt stupid. The reason he wanted to pack in, he felt stupid doing it. It wasn't that it was too difficult. He just felt a bit, he was out of a comfort zone that he would be yep. in. What is the science that you can explain to the golfer that then, because the way that I would always go about with my coaching, if, if I can't really explain what's going on and why we have to do this, so it sounds plausible, but what's the real science that makes this work? Yeah, okay. So if we, if we do a maths test right now, so... I, if I say to you, I, I want you to follow it along with this, Mark. What's five plus five? Right, I, didn't, I didn't buy in for this. Go on, <laughs> say again. What's five plus five? Ten. 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 <laughs> now, I know, I know your lad's at school, right? Yes. H how old is he? Thirteen. What would you think if that's how his teacher was teaching him maths? <laughs> it's, it's pretty poor. It's pretty poor because it's not challenging. It, he, he has to think maybe on the first one and then it just becomes repetition, repetition, repetition. So ultimately, that we'd be frustrated if our kids were being taught maths that way because we kind of know hey, that's not really effective but yet we're all practicing golf that way. Now, it doesn't work because the brain disengages. The brain gets bored. The brain seeks variability. The brain seeks challenge. The brain likes to uh, have to think. That's what generates what we call synaptogenesis. So synaptogenesis is, you, people listening might have heard the term, what you fire, you wire. So if you want to learn something, your brain has to be stimulated. It has to be under what we would call cognitive stress. It has to be firing and wiring. So in that maths lesson that I just gave you, it's very underwhelmed. It's not stimulated. If in golf, if you are just hitting ball after ball after ball, your brain disengages. You do not create cognitive stress. You do not create synaptogenesis. All you're doing is a light workout and just blood flow is going around the brain. You're not stimulating these electric currents that can eventually change the way that you move. So what Chris had was organized chaos. Your example, it was chaotic, but it was with inside the chaos. There was a task. Now his brain is hot. His brain is firing and wiring at this point but Chris isn't comfortable. Um, and me personally, I just think that's because Chris is perhaps the nicest guy in the world. One of the nicest guys you can meet. Right. So it didn't tailor to his needs as a human. Um, but ultimately it was a great learning environment because chaos was created. So just to try and wrap this answer up, when we practice, 
we do not want repetition. We are not trying to build muscle memory. Muscle memory doesn't exist. And rep after rep after rep will just lead to disengagement. When we are practicing, we want to create repetition without repetition. So we want to get our reps in, but we want to get them in, in different tasks, different environments in this organized chaos, because that stimulates the synapses of the brain that keeps that electricity flowing. And that will eventually allow us to change our movement or to learn how to inoculate the stress response when trying to play under pressure. Is, is there a place, um, for us coaches and, and for players, uh, because I, I, I guess the way I, ex the way I answer that question to my players is your brain's not working hard enough by doing the repetition. So it will learn better if we stress it and make it work harder. And I always try and give an analogy about going in the gym. If you just did the same thing all the time, you wouldn't get any stronger. You wouldn't get any fitter. Yeah. But so that's fine. And I, I, I love that. Um, explanation of it but is there a point so like block practice where we do hit repetition has like become the devil over the last five years hasn't it uh, yep. is there a place for it when we need to give players some confidence because it's easier yeah so they're very low or maybe when you're warming up going out before a tournament uh, is it is it dipping in and out of block and then back to something that is more like this? Or do you just go, no, I want variability and all this, the yeah, there's, aspects all the time? I was going to write something down there. There's two, there's two routes to take that. Blocked practice is great for a beginner. Yeah. I love block practice. Blocks of five. <laughs> <laughs> and then you change because it's blocked. I, I, I explained block practice earlier. A block of five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you know what I mean, though, hitting like pounding balls. And there's a difficult thing. I'm going to play the devil's advocate a little bit here because every single golfer that has been of any note in the game has done oodles of block practice. And I don't mean in fives, I mean in probably five. I have, I, I have mastered. The art of overcoming that objection that you've just I no, no, I'm sure you would have, but but they have, haven't they? So the, yeah. the examples are out there. So, but equally, I, hang on, just one second. Yeah. Uh, then I say often to players uh, that are trying to get on tour that one of the reasons why tournament players become so good, particularly journeyman guys that are trying to get there, is they play 35 tournaments a year sometimes under pressure. 100 that. rounds, that's like the best variable practice with some consequence you'll ever get, isn't it? So it's I agree with that. Totally agree with that. So let me, let me go back. So block practice is fine. Just don't, just do, for some, if someone wants, well, I tell you, when Alex Noren had that picture of his hands all chewed up, I, hey, all hail me, I hit 1,000 balls in a day. I would love to see a brain scan. Because he chewed up his hands, but he made no changes to the synapses in his brain. That's just a scientific fact. And, and I hope Alex Noren listens and we can have a conversation. Because um, I'm, I'm, I'm adamant about that. The, the scientists and researchers will tell you that. So if you want to go out and chew up your hands so they hurt next time you play in a tournament, hit a thousand balls in a day, but it's not going to make a change to your brain. If you are adverse to change, but want to practice more effectively, do block practice, just pick two tasks and change task every five balls. That's it. You, you, that is block practice. You're just changing task every interleave the two tasks. Sure. Um, and then I would say um, the goal of golf, if you want to learn something, it's not getting the feeling and keeping it. It's losing the feeling and being able to recall it back. That should be the goal of practice. Zach Parker is a master at this. He will give a kid five or six balls. If on ball three, if ball one, two, and three have been flushed, he doesn't let them hit the next, the next three. And he makes them do seven or eight reps of the other task. So then when they come back to this one, they have to search even harder to rediscover the success. That's how we learn. 
Um, That's why players don't like us as coaches, though. You know, you just get in the hang of it. We'll make them do something else. Exactly, because they're seeking comfort and we understand the science of learning. Yeah. And I say this to players. People will say, well, I don't agree with your philosophy because Ben Hogan told me that the secret was in the dirt. And VJ Singh <laughs> hit X amount of balls in X amount of hours. And I'm like, okay, let, let's take Ben Hogan for an example. I will let you practice how Ben Hogan practices if you agree to use the wooden shafted clubs that Ben Hogan used. And they're like, well, that's not going to work. Technology has advanced since then, and I want to take advantage of the technology. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Do you think the way that we understand how human beings has advanced since Ben Hogan played? So, again, because Nike or because TaylorMade or whoever put a $500 price tag on something and millions of dollars of marketing, we buy into the technology and the club fitting and the PXG and the sentence of strike. And it's great. It all makes a difference. But no company yet has put millions of dollars in, hey, we've worked out how you learn and this is how you should practice and promoted it and marketed it. It's just not sexy. It's just not fashionable. That's why it hasn't caught on because people will absolutely embrace the club technology but they're not embracing the science of how we learn. Also, it's hard work practicing like that. Yeah. That's why people don't, you know, they think there's a, there's a fast answer with a golf club. But, you know, mentally, um, you know, A, just having the information to be able to practice like that, you know, what aspects do you need to do? Um, and then it, it takes time, it takes patience. It, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? I, I, got, I got an email from a guy that said, I am getting so much better at golf. And all I did was move the pyramid of balls five feet back and limit myself to one ball a minute. He said, the strike that I'm getting on the range is now as close as it's ever been to the strike I'm getting on the course. So instead of stand there and go rake, hit, rake, hit, rake, hit, he's now walk, pick up a ball, walk, put it down, plan the shot, action the shot as he walks to get the next ball reflect on the shot call it par plan act reflect the environment that he has just moving the balls back taking about a minute per ball has helped him transfer his skill. that's the only thing he's done he's this guy has watched a lot of my videos <laughs> that's the only thing he's actioned and i'm like wow that's kind of boring and simple but it's worked but they, how many people would think they're wasting time doing that? The average golfer would quite often think he's wasting time, wouldn't it? I, I think he would assume he's going to waste time until he actually has the experience of doing it. Absolutely. And then he will leave the range more mentally tired and less physically tired, which should be the goal of, of practice when we're trying to change our golf swing. Okay, moving tax slightly now. Uh, I sort of know your answer to this one, but I'll, I'll let you answer it for the folks. How important do you think it is to be technically sound in whatever department? Yeah, very important. Ha ha absolutely. Um, you've seen me, Chip. I'm not seeing that action on the PGA Tour anytime <laughs> soon. One shot and then I turn away and don't look again. Man, I chipped it. To, it was in the Euro Pro Pro Am. I chipped it to like four feet, and then I missed it. Um, yeah, it's very, it's it, it it it's very important. There's no doubt that on the tour, there is a certain level of of technical proficiency. It, it's it's absolutely there for everyone to see. But I think there's two things that are more important. Good. That was my next question. Yeah, I think. Um, if you take Jordan Spieth, there are technical, how would you put it, idiosyncrasies that lead to bad shots. Um, you know, Tiger with, with the big stick, right? There's still yeah. certain things that he's done. And you can go to the Corn Ferry Tour or you can go to PGA Tour Canada and you can probably find guys that, in inverted commas, swing it better than those two. 
and I know people have got their self-talk going listening to this, but just, just hold, your, hold your thoughts. Theoretically, if you look at just the technique in isolation, there are guys that swing it better than Jordan Spieth on the corn ferry. But what they do not do better than him is adapt to the environmental demands of the golf course and adapt to the psychological stresses of tournament play. Because those two things, understanding how you have to adapt to the, the land and the, the, the environment that golf is played in, adapt to the golf course, the lies, the wind, and then being able to control that stress response under enormous pressure playing for millions of dollars with people watching, body juices flowing around your body that most humans will never experience. Being able to access your technique in those moments is critical. And those two things, how, the, how you adapt to the land and controlling the, the stress response, are they come before the club starts to move. So there were, I, I, that's what I like to teach. And then I like to partner up with coaches like yourself um, or, or, or other guys that, that I've partnered with in the USA to, to teach the golf swing. Sure. Uh, so obviously we're talking today about trying to get your A game out onto the, the golf course. And we talked yeah. a lot about practicing. So my, my final couple of points are... How, how do we do, and you, you sort of alluded to it there with, with what is more important, but how, how do we get better at dealing with the pressure? So dealing with the pressure of like, you know, for an average golf, it just could be first tee nerves. You know, uh, we've worked with, with players that have struggled to, once they get in contention, that, you know, they've, they've not coped with that very well. How, how do you get better at dealing with the pressure and the stress that comes with golf? Because it happens to everybody at some point, doesn't it? Yeah. No matter what kind of golfer you are. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, there's, 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 many, there's many things that we can talk about, but, and, and it's very dependent on the individual and, and their psychology and their biology and their social surrounding and the person they are, et cetera. Um, but a, a very generic answer would be, if you want to learn to adapt to the golf course, and if you want to learn to deal with stress and pressure, then you need to be on the golf course dealing with stress and pressure. So I, I'm a big believer that the game can do the teaching. So for example, I'll play, I'll give you an example of a couple of games I play with students. Um, I, depending on whatever level they are, uh, let's take the youngest kid I work with, a kid called Caden Drum, 12 years old, wants to play college golf. Um, so, we start from the very forward ladies tees and he has to make three birdies. Once he's made three birdies, he goes to tees way longer than he would normally play. And he has to be level par for those tees. If he is not level par for those tees, he loses all his birdies and we start again. And he has four hours to complete the challenge. Um, we call it the closeout and we play that very often. I'm going to assume if he gets in contention during a tournament that he's got some mental reps of playing closeout and accessing good movements during this game that will help him. So, so again, in short, really what you've done is you've recreated as close as you can to the environment and, and the experience he's going to have. Yeah. And there's a time limit. And yeah. every, every, sometimes we'll play that, sec, that second uh, set of holes with drawback. Every second putt, we have to add two feet onto it. And depending what his shot pattern is that day, if he's hitting pool draws, I'll say, hey, if you're in the left rough, it's 10-yard penalty backwards. But if you're on the fairway or the right rough, then um, I'll give you a 25-yard reward. Just to try and let the game do the teaching. But... Ultimately, I have a lot of games like that that I'd play. Um, I have one that I'm doing with a guy from PJ Tour Canada. We designed it together. We spent a whole session designing it together, and it's brutal. Um, I, I can't I, remember. I'd that. like that. I'll you try and find it. You need to send me that. I'd like that. 
<laughs> I'll find it. Um, I don't think he can ever complete it, but that's good for him because he's, he's a very, very, he reminds me a lot of Chris. He's, he's a very model pro, wants to do the right things, wants to create good habits, journals a lot. So I, I have a lot of these games, but ultimately when you set foot and you want to deal with pressure, pressure tends to come from the outcome. The score we're going to shoot, lowering our handicap, winning the medal, qualifying for the challenge tour, keeping your card, making the cut. It's all outcome, 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 outcome. And then what players will do is they'll go and play with their friends. And sometimes they won't even play for 10 pounds. They'll just play. And if they hit a bad shot, they'll pick it up and they'll drop it somewhere else and they'll just play. The games I design, I am loading the player with outcome after outcome after outcome. So when they start to have success in these games or when they get off to a real bad start but then start to balance it out and recover a little bit or when they start really well and then fail a bit and then get it back it's all representative of tournament play but way more load the cognitive load that I'm trying to place on them is higher in practice because there might be seven, eight, nine, ten different rules to these games, all tailored to that individual. Then when they get in tournament play, it's almost like, oh, thank God I can just play now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, I, yeah, that's how, that's how I would do it. That's, I, that's a, a, a fantastic um, answer. Um, you've got some awesome material online at gamelighttraining.com. Plug, gratuitous plug, yes. Yeah, I think the best thing now, um, we, we, we have that information, it's still available, but we've moved the uh, online courses. Um, so the main thing that we have right now is uh, our online courses that are for players and that are for golfers. Um, they're at uh, a slightly different um, address. Uh, that host our online courses. Yeah, Golf Mastery. Um, so it would be golfmastery.kajabi.com. Cool. And your podcast is called Beyond the Mind. Absolutely. Beyond the Mind, uh, it's been going not that long, um, but I've been, I've been committed to it. We had a good conversation on, on the level of commitment that we're going to put into our podcasts. Um, yeah, if you go on iTunes or if you search uh, Beyond the Mind, uh, it's really all about willpower doesn't overly work if you truly want to make positive change, you have to change your environment, which, again, we've, we've talked a lot about in this Which is this exactly podcast. what we've just been talking yeah. about, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and if anybody wants to know more about you, ianhighfield.com, yes? Uh, yeah, Ian. ianhighfield.com. And everything's going to steadily migrate over today. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, Ian, ianhighfield.com. And they can email me at ian at ianhighfield.com. Um, I'm giving free 30-minute power calls. So if people want to jump on a call and ask me a question about golf, um, they can just email me on there, uh, and I'm more than happy to to have a free free call. I, or they can message me on Instagram. I have had a lot of 30 minute power calls. In fact, they're <laughs> usually about an hour and a half, aren't they? Yeah, we 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 go for a while. Yeah, can't do 30 minutes normally. Ian, it's been absolutely awesome having you. Um, you are without doubt one of the most positive people I know, and absolutely love chewing the fat for an hour or so. So I hope. The people out there have listened, but more importantly, I hope they've found some ways of getting their best golf out onto the golf course. Thank you, mate. I, I love you. You're a good man. You too, mate. Thanks a lot. And I, I, I'm very pleased. It's kind of fitting that I was the, the first guest after everything that, that you've done for me. So I, I'll always appreciate that, Mark. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you, buddy. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, dude. Bye-bye. Cheers. You have just listened to the Winning Golf Podcast with Mark Pearson. Please subscribe and review in all the usual places on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and for further information, visit www.pmg.academy. Take your game to the next level.